Okay, uh, welcome to the April 11th meeting of the Administration and Public Works Committee. Uh, may we have a roll, or uh, may we have a uh, attendance? Roll call. Okay. Um, so we are called to order. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular administration and public works uh, committee meeting from March 28th? So moved. Moved by Councilmember Braithwaite, seconded by Councilmember Nusma. Uh, I will second with uh, one comment, which I believe uh, a correction is already in the works. And this is in relation to item A14 uh, that appears on page 15 of 352 of our packet. Uh, the item last time was the Evanston Municipal Operations Zero Emission Strategy. And I would just like to make sure the minutes reflect that uh, the direction given by the council was to pursue the most uh, aggressive uh, scenario, uh, transformative change. So uh, Director Stoneback is showing me that it is now in there and um, we're good to go. Okay. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, any abstentions? Seeing none, the motion passes. That brings us to public comment. Mr. Vasilko, I'm going to assume. Okay. Uh, okay. So I sent a note around prior to this. Hopefully you, you received it. Uh, agenda item A4. Staff wants to issue a non-bid contract to board space for $75,000 uh, a year for three years to supply unspecified furniture replacements. Uh, staff said board space is the exclusive steel case furniture representative in Chicago. That is just not true. There are There is at least one other dealer who is a steel case furniture representative. Um, that company interiors for business should be contacted for a competitive uh, number for the unit prices that they're getting from board space. So bottom line, that should not be, that should not go forward because the basis of the selection is not accurate. Item A9, uh, staff recommends purchasing two Ford V8 uh, engine pickup trucks uh, I think for $87,000. I'm never a fan of buying so many vehicles, but if we have to buy them, why can't they be electric vehicles? Agenda item A11. Uh, here again, we're, it, it sounds like we're issuing a $707,000 contract, a no bid contract to a general contractor, Garland DBS. Uh, and Garland DBS is getting three bids for us from a subcontractor um, whether they're working on that site already or not, they should not be given a $707,000 no-bid general contractor um, contract. Under the bills list, uh, I just, I'm just asking, did the city council previously approve a purchase of $110,000 for a public works truck? That's listed as in the bills, in the bills list. Um, I'd also like somebody to clarify, again, it sounds like a good cause, but it, it's written that Kurt's Cafe was at an expense of $20,000 uh, for the Food for Violence Reduction Program. Sounds like a good program. I'd just like to know more about the $20,000 expenditure. From the BMO credit card list, um, I'm confused why we're spending $1,500 for a lead registration for the animal shelter. And I didn't know that that project was going forward already. I didn't think it had been approved. Um, and if so, shouldn't this, but shouldn't this expense be part of that budget, not just part of a, a credit card bill? Um, 
Mr. Vasilka, I'm going to ask you to wrap up in 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. So I read about this donation of the soccer pitches. I don't understand why it's a donation if the city is still has to come up with $150,000 for a non-budgeted item. And lastly, I read about a, a skate park being budgeted for $750,000. And based on what I see in the drawing information, it's going to be a lot more than that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Venata, Jeremy Venata. Hi. Yep, I'm on. <clears throat> I'm. Uh, I'm here to talk in uh, favor of the street soccer pitches. Um, the proposed site at Church and Darrow is, uh, has been blighted for years. There's not any proposed um, building on that until uh, probably 2024 spring. Um, this is a low cost way of activating the site. And um, we've had multiple street soccer pitches up in Evanston around town. We've had them at ETHS. We had one at Robert Crown before it was redesigned for over two years. Um, it was by city admission, it was um, the most used public amenity other than the beach. Um, it's uh, it's very close to ETHS and we get a lot of play, I think. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions about it. Thank you. And then finally, uh, Ms. Allen. Francine Allen. Yes, thank you. I'm just here to see if there's any update on the um, sewer issue. I'll be happy to um, wait until that comes up at the end. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't anticipate that there will be an update today, but certainly a member is free to ask uh, about that. Okay. If there isn't one at this meeting, might there be one at the following? Uh, certainly in the future there will be an update on it. I can't say that it'll be at the next meeting, but uh, we'll keep you posted. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, now moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, I first will ask, are there any items that folks are seeking to remove from the consent agenda? Uh, A4. A9 and A11, just to um, answer those questions. And I guess also I'm trying to find them, but the items that Mr. Fasilka asked about, I th um, the grapple truck, I think, I believe that was in the general fund and the, um, and the Kurtz Cafe expense, um, just if we can maybe just get some clarification on those expenses. And I also, um, and also regarding the animal shelter. Um, since that hasn't, we haven't actually voted on that yet. Uh, and I think those are all, are the two items regarding the truck and the um, cafe expense, I think those are both in the general fund. And Bills, A1, so uh, can you repeat what you're taking off? You're taking off A1, which A4, is- A4, A4, A9, oh right, A1 for the bills pay list, is that right? And then A4, A9, A11. I'd like to take A5 off as well. And A5, I'd also like to take off A6. Uh, is there anything else? Okay. Uh, A12 is not off. More so flagging, I think, because I think you wanted to. Yeah, I'll take A12 off. Okay. Um, anything else? Since that list is getting pretty long, I'm comfortable leaving A5 on consent agenda. which leaves us with A1, A4, A6, A9, A11, and A12 coming off. Okay. Uh, do you have a motion to move the consent agenda minus A1, A4, A6, A9, A11, and A12? Second. Moved by Councilmember 
Kelly, seconded by Councilmember Newsma. All those in favor? Or actually, I'm sorry, we'll take a roll call on the consent agenda. Uh, we can remove A7 as well. A7 is now off? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, roll call, then? Yes. Council Member Braithwaite? Aye. Council Member Newsma? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. Council Member Kelly? Aye. Okay. Uh, the ayes have it. Uh, we can go through uh, the consent agenda. Let us start with item A1. Mr. Chair, I'll move item A1, uh, approval of the City of Evanston payroll bills list and credit card activity uh, from the period of March 14th through March 27th in the amount of $2,637,882.22 and bills list for April 12th in the amount of $2,208,341.66 uh, credit card activity for the period ending February 26th in the amount of 237,880.96. Moved by Councilman Renusma, seconded by. Seconded by, seconded by Councilmember Braithwaite. Uh, any. Councilmember Kelly. Um, can, is Mr. Rivera here? Or um, to just answer that question, I think it probably was, but did we previously approve the. The grapple truck for 110. Good evening, uh, Chair and members of the committee. Sean Cholick, Manager of Facilities and Fleet Management. Um, yes, to answer that question, um, that grapple truck was approved uh, by the City Council on March 22nd of 21. Um, a partial payment was made for that vehicle um, for the chassis to get a, a, a prepayment discount. And then this was the remainder of the, the, the cost, um, which was uh, invoiced and paid for once the body arrived with the chassis on April 11th. Great. Thank you so much. And um, while you're there, sure. I think there was another question regarding, um, oh, it's, it's not in the, it's not in the, the bills list. So. I think it's in regards to A9, so I'll okay. cover that when we get to that Great. one. Great. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further questions regarding item A1? Seeing no. No, I think there was one more. Um, and then just the 20000 can someone just give us an explanation about that expense at Kurt's Cafe? Uh, I was hoping that uh, Audrey Thompson would be here to respond to that, but. I'm here. Okay, oh, great. Okay. Thank you. I'm here. Oh, no problem. So um, those were for all of the fees associated with uh, food in the parks for um, the entire summer from June until um, October. So all of our first Friday events, all of our block parties, um, that was the payment for Kurt's Cafe, which was our food vendor for our My City, Your City, Our City initiative, our Safe Summer initiative. Perfect. Thank you so much. Really no, no problem. Director, I, I think this, whenever you have a question like this, it gives you a wonderful opportunity to share how many people were served over the summer months and how it helped to contribute to making it a safe summer for all of Evanston. Sure. Thank you. So um, our first Friday event started in June. We had one June, July, August. Um, and then we skipped September and came back in October for a fall fest, including a back to school event with about 12 partners. Um, each one of those events um, had over 300 in attendance. And so um, that doesn't even include our block parties that started our Safe Summer Initiative on Hovland, uh, which we will return again this year and uh, complete the same type of activities. Um, in addition to that, um, there were no complaint tickets during the entire summer um, written by the Evanston Police Department for youth. Um, and there were actually um, no shootings um, for the entire summer um, while the initiative was taking place. So I'm um, pretty successful. We'll start again this year. So um, get ready. It'll be a fun summer. Fun and safe. Thank you for your report. Thank you. Are there any other lights? Seeing none. One. Uh, thank you, Audrey, uh, for that update, and thank you for that question, both Councilmember Kelly and Nusma. 
I mean, sorry, and Braithwaite. Uh, all those in favor, saying no further questions, all those in question. favor? Okay, Council Member Kelly. Just regarding the animal shelter, I know it's not a large expense, but um, I know the previous city council did vote on a certain amount of money for um, for consulting on that, and I'm just wondering um, in terms of how expenditures go, since we haven't yet voted on, you know, how much we want to spend or if we're going to spend on the animal shelter, um, how does that work in terms of, you know, credit card payments towards that? Thank you. Members of the committee, my name is Laura Biggs. I'm the city engineer. So on November 8th, 2021, the city council the approved amendment number one to the contract with Holliburn Root to complete the concept design, schematic design, to final drawings for co contract and construction services. So since that contract was approved, then staff took that as approval to do the contract and we've been moving forward with design. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Biggs. Are there any further questions? No, okay, thank you. Seeing no further questions, uh, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed, any abstentions? The motion passes. That brings us to item A4. We have a motion for item A4, award of contract for forward space for office furniture supply. Uh, Mr. Chair, I will move item A4, A4 mm -hmm. award of contract with forward space for office furniture supply in the not to exceed amount of $75,000 per year. Moved by Councilmember Newsma, seconded by, Second. by Councilmember Braithwaite. Any uh, questions? Councilmember Kelly. Um, so, you know, it was stated that Interiors for Business um, is a competitive company. Can we see if we can get a better bid on that? Ms. Biggs. Hello, Laura Biggs, City Engineer. Um, so that was not well stated in the memo. Forward Space is the only company on the source, well, on a community purchasing program that offers steel case in the Chicago area. So um, the way that furniture pricing works is that for a company like Steelcase, what we're actually finding out as the competitive price is a discount off of the manufacturer's standard retail price. And there is a standard government discount that local, state, and federal governments can get from Steelcase off of the MSRP, and it varies by product, so I can't tell you exactly what it is. It might be 10% off this chair, but 30% off this filing cabinet. It just depends on the, the item. And the source well is actually giving us a better discount than what we would get for the government contract price for um, Steelcase furniture, and for that reason, we went with the source well contract. I'm not sure exactly. I'm trying. So, so we didn't get a government contract. I mean, a government um, reduction on this. In previous years, actually, we we switched to source well last term also. But prior to five years ago, we would just negotiate. We would request for. Um, proposals and we do a general thing, but we get the same government discount from everybody. What varies can be like what they agree is like delivery times and other things associated with the furniture contract that they could negotiate. However, when, sort, when Steelcase through Forward Space negotiated the source well contract prices, which was a competitive bid just by somebody else, they agreed to a better discount than the government program because SourceWell also serves schools, which gets a better discount than government. So just so I'm clear, so the reason it was a no bid is because it's the only company that does this for, at a, you said community? I mean, what's the 
So a community purchasing program, which we use not just um, the capital planning and engineering group, but the city of Evanston uses for um, other departments as well for different things. Community purchasing is where one government entity bids it on behalf of a lot of government entities. And um, source the source well contracts used frequently, but for example, Fleet often uses the state bid, which is another community purchasing agreement. And so the only government one that we're aware of on source well is the forward space. On other categories on source well, there might be multiple people to choose from, but not for furniture post purchasing. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate the explanation. Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? <laughs> the motion carries. That brings us to item uh, A6, and I think uh, A6 and A7 uh, are similar and should be moved together. Uh, for Mr. Efficiency. Chair, I will move item A6 and A7, A6 being approval of contract award with Christy Weber and Company Landscape for the 2022 citywide landscape maintenance. Uh, this is bid 22-20 in the amount of $83,975. I will also jointly move item A7, approval of a contract award with Herrera Landscape and Snow Removal for park mowing services. This is bid 22-21 in the amount of $32,400. Okay, is there a second? So, uh, moved by Councilman Bernusma, seconded by Councilmember Braithwaite. Are there any questions regarding this item? Council Member Kelly. Let's see. So this is A6? A6 and A7. Yep. Okay. So this is for landscape. Um, do we know how, and maybe Jonathan, you know, in terms of electric, are they up to speed with our expectations going forward for CARP and electric mowers and can anybody, does anybody who, Who's the staff person who prepared this? Uh, Manager Stonebeck. Good evening. Uh, no, I do not know if they are using electric vehicle or electric equipment to perform the work. I would have to double check that. Okay. Um, I would like to maybe, could we, could I hold this till we find out if, um, if that's the case? Uh, yeah, I would put a call in to find the answer. I just don't Yeah, know. I mean, we it could do it right tonight even. It's it would be required to honor whatever the law says for the summer of 2022, right? right? Correct, yes. They would have to follow their current city ordinance. But in the event that they aren't already equipped, that's going to be a big expense. And that, I mean, I just, it seems like it would be in our interest to look at companies that are already looking forward. And maybe they are. I just am asking. I, I do not have the answer. I don't know. Uh, Councilmember Kelly? Is there any chance we could find out? Um, I mean, I don't want to hold up the process, but I do think that's an important aspect given our focus on moving to electric. I, I don't know that I'd right. be able to reach them tonight. Okay. I don't have a phone number right now or an email. I could attempt to do so before the council meeting but or by the next meeting or, honestly i have to go back and look to see what the requirements are for this summer anyway yeah. um they whatever they are they would be obligated to honor the requirements that have existed since we passed this issue a few months ago so i'm not sure what change of outcome there would be I, I do know that our specs would require them to follow city ordinances. Right. No, so I understand that. I don't that. know I if just we don't. mentioned specifically in the bid package or not whether or not you had to use electric equipment. It's I haven't part been of around program. public works all that much. Sure. No, I understand. It just seems um, it would be good to work with companies that that's you know fundamental part of their program going forward, where we're not pushing them or they're having to you know increase costs because of our requirements. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Is there, are there any further questions or is there a motion? I meant a motion from Councilmember Kelly. 
Okay. Um, I, I also uh, had some questions. I was interested in uh, this; these items potentially being. Uh, we received an email from a leader in our environmental community uh, who uh, asked that with environmental concerns that we hold uh, off on beginning our uh, landscaping for uh, an additional month uh, until June, and that would have a significant impact on our environment. And so while I, I don't know if I want to impose uh, any new requirement on uh, the firms. I do think uh, holding off on uh, that both has uh, uh, an environmental impact as well as a financial impact in, in that we would potentially save uh, a month or, or more worth of, uh, of work. And so I'm, I am interested in uh, tabling this item, uh, one, to have staff uh, get the a new pricing on if we held off on on starting the service for a month uh, and uh, to get uh, a bit of the environmental impact that that would have as well. I, are you tabling it? So I, I first will ask Council Member, uh, I'll first go to Council Member Burns uh, who has turned his light on uh, and then I will ask a question of our staff. Council Member Burns. Uh, thank you, Chair. If, if this is going to be tabled also uh, between now and the next time this makes its way on the agenda, I'm curious if, uh, if we've ever separated the um, contracts, the mass cutting and the weekly litter and debris cleanup. Um, you know, as we try to get more Evanston-based businesses um, access to these contracts, I think it's it's always challenging to uh, t to do this level of um, of mass cutting. But I think debris and cleanup, if we were to separate that, similar to what IDOT does, they I believe have a contract where they have um, they bid out specifically just debris and litter cleanup on the side of our expressways. And I think if we can do something similar here in Evanston, we might make these contracts more available to Evanston-based businesses. So I would just love to see if that's something that we've done before. And um, I would imagine that there's a cost benefit to rolling it all into uh, to one bid, which I'm sensitive to, but I just would like to know the um, the, the thought process behind that and if, if it's ever something we've done. Uh, the reason that we keep the litter pickup with the mowing is that the litter pickup should be done just before the mowing. Otherwise, uh, cups or debris that's out there just gets shredded up in the mower and becomes a bigger litter problem. So you would almost double the effort if you hired somebody to do litter pickup at one time. The mowing company would still have to do litter pickup pick up before they mowed. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Kelly, did you? So I'm going to move to uh, hold this, or to, I'm sorry, not hold it. I'm going to move to uh, table this. Uh, Director Stonebeck, when is our, or Manager Stonebeck, when is our next meeting? Is it? On April 25th. Yes, I'm going to move to table it to the 25th. Is there a second? I'll second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, any abstentions? Uh, the ayes have it. Items A6 and A7 are tabled to the 25th uh, with uh, seeking to, uh, to be clear, what I'm seeking and other folks can chime in is that we'd look into moving this back a month and seeing what the cost savings are and if we can negotiate something. Yeah. Uh, By our ordinance, they don't need to comply until 23, right, but I can still check with them. Yeah. And then uh, Councilman Burns has laid out the questions that he has. 
Okay, uh, that moves us to item A9, uh, purchase of vehicles for administrative services department and public works agency for, uh, Jesus, Rosh Ford, I assume. Mr. Chair, I will move that item uh, in the dollar amount of 87046 Great. Uh, it's been moved by Councilmember Nusma and seconded by Second. Councilmember Burns. Uh, any discussion on this item? I think there was a question about uh, the possibility of using Ford F-150 uh, electric trucks. Correct. Um, Sean Cholik, Manager of Facilities and Fleet Management. Um, yes, Ford is now making an EV F-150 pickup called the Lightning, uh, which we are very, very interested in. Um, me and members of my team actually went to go see it when it was being showcased for the first time. Um, in a nearby location. The, um, the trick that we're having right now is that the current situation with the um, automotive market and components uh, puts a little bit of a damper into our planning and, and some of the things that we would like to move forward with. Um, so although we are interested in this truck, um, right now the cooperative purchasing contract um, has expired and we expect one to be open again in the fall, in which at that point we'll, we'll look into, you know, getting some electric uh, F-150s. Um, but right now the estimated build time for them is a year minimum. And with the way we've seen things going, we anticipate that it could even be more than a year. So what we, what we're, well, why we're recommending these two gas versions, which are V6s, not V8s, um, I think there was a little bit of uh, uh, confusion in the in the quote, but they're actually V6s. Um, our plan is to move forward with these so that we can acquire them because they're on 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 a lot. They're readily available, and we'll, we'll be able to secure them. You know, probably within the, a week or two. Um, so if we can get these and, and keep on track with our current replacement plans for these two vehicles that are well overdue. Um, we, we feel that that would be a better plan um, to, to get these now while they're available. And purchase the electric vehicles next time around. Correct. Our plan would be to look into getting at least one, um, you know, the, the, next, the next time that they put them out there. The other thing that, that is kind of tricky for us is typically when they build these vehicles, they only have so many build slots. So if we don't get the approval and get it in in time, uh, we, we've actually had them tell us, oh, you know, yeah, we'd like to give you a quote, but all the slots are already filled up. So once they hit that that amount of slots, they they stop uh, stop building them. But that would be our plan to move forward with them in the future. Thank Thanks. you, uh, sure. Council Member Burns. Yeah, I had this the same question, and and I I think what will help because you'll you'll probably get this question every time you purchase yeah. a vehicle, at least from this council. I think what would help is to better understand what that schedule looks like over the next few years and what um, deadlines we need to meet as a, as a council because you're definitely going to get that question every time we purchase a vehicle. And I saw the same thing, the you know, F-150 Lightning. I think there's some hybrid options as well. Uh, so it's just making sure that really every time we're purchasing a vehicle, we should, in my opinion, be going hybrid or um, all electric unless there's some barrier to us doing it. I know you and I talked about sometimes the power isn't there. So I didn't know for this particular vehicle if um, if there was a um, if there was a, a a tow weight that you know the electric vehicles would not support for whatever reason. But um, I'd love to see that a, a schedule. Sure. You know, projecting out the next several years about what deadlines and pockets we need to hit in order to do that. Right, and part of the trick with that is it's kind of a moving target because we don't know what these deadlines and these these build these slots are going to become. Uh, for example, we've got a fire engine that we're going to start looking into getting getting a price on. They used to take one year to build. Now they're anticipating that it'll take 24 months. So. I don't think the manufacturers quite know yet what those target dates are going to be, but we'll continue to, you know, touch base with them and try to uh, pinpoint them to 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 more of a a better range so that we can, you know, share that with you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, looking forward, I, I think we are going to be exploring an RFP uh, to do a study on fleet electrification. 
Yes, right? that's and correct. Lay out exactly that schedule that Councilmember Burns was talking about. Yes. Yeah, I've been working with uh, Cara Pratt on that, um, talking to her a little bit about that RFP, and, um, and that will be something that we'll, we'll be interested in seeing. Thank you. Sure. Yes, uh, and I'll just, uh, is there any, any further questions on that? Uh, I'll just add that uh, with my discussion with Mr. Tolk, you can take a seat, don't worry. Uh, this uh, weekend, or Friday or this weekend, uh, I had similar concerns, but also looking down the chain, how, what are we doing with the vehicles that are being replaced uh, with this? And, uh, you know, one, is there an environmentally friendly thing we can do with those vehicles? And then secondly, uh, can we use an equity lens to uh, both uh, to see what we can uh, do with these vehicles and make use for them for Evanston residents, uh, which led to a discussion about bikes as well uh, and other uh, surplus uh, equipment that we have here. Okay, uh, seeing no further questions on uh, this item, uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. And any abstentions, uh, the ayes have it. Uh, the motion passes. That leads us to item A11. Mr. Chair, I move item A11, approval of the contract with Garland DBS for the water plant head house roof and masonry improvements in the amount of $707,281. Moved by uh, Council Member Nusma, seconded by Someone? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Braithwaite. Uh, any questions on this item? Councilmember Kelly. Um, I, again, could uh, maybe if you could just explain the no bid. Members of the committee, my name is Laura Biggs. I'm the city engineer. Um, so Garland DBS is another community purchasing type of program, uh, again, we're using SourceWell for this one. There used to be a wider variety, but they have all consolidated under SourceWell. And the city of Evanston has used Garland since uh, 2011, I believe, to do roofing projects. Uh, they've actually, I, the city of Atlanta has bid a roofing contract essentially and Garland is the been the successful uh, uh, recipient of that contract and then all of the communities in the United States can choose to use that bid if they wish the way that the Garland contract is structured is a little different Garland provides roofing materials they also do tuck pointing windows and door replacements as well so they provide all of the materials and then they bid out through their own pre-qualified vendors the actual labor. So they always go to at least three vendors, get their bid prices for labor, and then they add all of it up and tell us what the best deal is. And we usually end up going with the lowest price that they found. The vendors that they're using include vendors that the city would be reaching out to directly if we were bidding it um, completely on our own without Garland being involved. One of the benefits to using Garland is they provide the design and the construction oversight included in their cost of materials, essentially. So the city would get those things for free, although nothing is for free, and we have found them to do a consistently good job on their design and construction services. And it's a substantial savings on staff time. Uh, we also don't have roofing designers necessarily, so um, we would probably be contracting that out frequently if we did not have Garland. So we would have to go out for another contract to get the design and the construction oversight. So that that is where the time savings is. We have not done a direct comparison of pricing lately on if Garland is the most cost effective. But I will tell you a few years ago when we did the fog houses, they came in substantially less expensive than a previous um, roofing contract on the fog houses that had not been done because it came in high. I don't actually have the numbers for the fog houses, but it, it, it saved a couple of hundred thousand dollars for the city of Evanston that 
the original contract had not been done, and then we waited a few years, and then we did the we use Garland to do it. So Garland will do historically sensitive buildings. They will do all kinds of roofing materials, and they will also do tuck pointing windows and doors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions on that item? Uh, seeing none, uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those uh, opposed, any abstentions? Uh, the ayes have it. All right, may I have a motion for item A12? Mr. Chair, I move item A12, resuming water shutoffs as a result of non-payment. Okay. Uh, are there any questions on this item? Uh, is there a second? second. Correct. Second. Seconded by Council Member Burns. Um, are there any questions on this item? Okay, I, I just, uh, uh, okay, Council Member Burns. I was, and we could have a discussion, but I was just thinking for the sake of time, it seems like there's still some, quite a bit of data that isn't available yet that we're waiting on. So just want to know, does it make sense to spend too much time discussing this now until we have that, that information? Sure, and in fact, given that, would it, I mean, this is just accepting and placing on file a document, can we, table this uh do you think mr king that some of the data that we're still waiting for might be available on the 25th or the meeting after that uh, good evening chair reed members of the committee daryl king water production bureau chief yes that uh data will actually be available tomorrow and um i won't be available on the 25th but the meeting thereafter i, I will be so then uh is the committee fine tabling this until uh, what meeting would that be? The first meeting in a uh, go ahead. Although I I will be here on April twenty fifth. Oh okay. If you can yeah yeah. Well then we'll we'll just have direct manager Stone back. So we'll bring it back on the twenty fifth. Um, uh, may I have a motion to table this until the twenty fifth? So move. Moved by Councilmember Newsma, seconded by second. Second. by Councilmember Kelly. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Uh, if the ayes have it, uh, this will come back to the meeting on the 25th with the uh, data that we are still uh, looking for. Great. Okay, that brings us uh, to item uh, D1, uh, progressive wheel tax. Yep. I'm sorry. Uh, that brings us to, oh, yep, A13. My apologies. Mr. Item Chair, for I'll consideration. Move item uh, A13, ordinance 16-0-22, amending Title 10, Chapter 11, Section 16, Schedule 16A, uh, designation of truck routes and bicycle routes. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? Second. Moved by Councilmember Newsom, seconded by Councilmember Brithwaite. Uh, is there any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussion, uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, any abstentions? The ayes have it. The motion passes. All right. Um, Mr. Chair, I will move item A14 with your permission. Yes. Uh, you are permitted. Uh, ordinance 29-0-22, amending city code title four building regulations and title five housing regulations. Great. Second, uh, moved by Councilmember Newsom, seconded by Councilmember Braithwaite. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any abstentions? Any, any all those opposed say no. Uh, great, the item passes. Uh, that brings us to item A15, ordinance 30022, amending city code 10 for stopping, standing, or parking. Do I have a motion? I'll make the motion. So moved by Councilmember Newsom, seconded by by Councilmember Burns. Uh, is there any discussion on this item? This is A15. Uh, this is the one uh, that Councilmember Suffered and put forward to allow uh, commercial trucks to be parked in front of, of houses overnight, commercial vehicles. Uh, Interim uh, Manager Tatara. Hello, members of the committee. Uh, Dr. Tatara, Acting Division 
parking manager. So this was the um, uh, by request by the council member Safranen to uh, help create the permit for the vehicles which right now are abandoned for parking overnight because they are commercial vehicles. They seem commercial vehicles like the pickup trucks or the trucks which have um, company lettering or signing like Domino's Pizza or stuff like this. So this is supposed to help uh, those residents who have assigned work vehicle um, to obtain the permit and park in front of the house. Does that make sense? So I, I remember having a conversation about this and my concern obviously is depending on where it's parked, depending on the size of the vehicle, this could be an incredible headache for for residents. So fast forward, if somebody has a car now, and especially if it's a narrow street, you're going to start getting phone calls that there's a larger vehicle. And I wasn't sure when I read through this. So we have a limitation in there. So this will be a limitation to the B plate, which is common for the pickup trucks, and for the FP plate, which is the fleet plate rental. So this will, you still cannot attach any attachments to the vehicles. You still cannot have a trailers. You still, the only one accessory which you can have on the car is basically the radar rack. So this is kind of limitation towards the uh, pickup trucks or the work vans. So you carved out the pickup trucks, because the, the landscaping trucks, yes. anything. So it's really just, and the deciding factor with the vehicles there are those that are wrapped and, and also the, the, the plate, the plate uh, uh, excuse me, the type of the plate. So any plate, B plate, which is uh, usually right now, it's for the, for the pickup trucks and for the vans, they have a B plate. Any larger commercial vehicles require a different because of the size and of the uh, gross weight. So this is only basically applied only to the pickup trucks and to the working vans. Any larger vehicles require a different license plate. Yeah, it would have been helpful to have a list of the vehicles. I'm not as familiar as I probably should be, but I, based well, on I, what you're saying, I'm not as concerned, but I just wish we had a complete so, list. Luke, I had a resident. Oh, I'm sorry, can I, uh, Councilmember Kelly, and then uh, Councilmember Newsom. So the B plate can be up to 8,000 pounds, correct? Yes. I mean, that's a big truck to have out in front of a house. I mean, I, I just think there's going to be neighborhoods where you're going to have Definitely. certain neighborhoods that are going to have a lot more of this, and I don't think it's really fair to the neighbors to have so this or you is, could potentially maybe in you know certain wards you might have one, and no big deal. But in other wards, I mean, an eight thousand pound truck. That's I'm looking at a picture of one now, and I, you know if that were parked in front of my house, and you know. So this is in response for the other money yeah. request to draft something. Uh, I think our ordinance before was reason why we restricted for all this reason which you give, uh, which you mentioned, council member. So, but we was requested by the council to draft something, and that's the best way we can come up with uh, to regulate those, um, to amend the code. Uh, Councilman, is it any further questions, Councilmember Kelly? Uh, so, I'll, I'm sorry, can you say with the plate, sorry again, you said a B plate and B plate what? and FP plate. And F, P. Uh, as well FP as passenger plate. plate. Uh, the passenger plate, yes. Not F. So, excuse me, FP, that's the uh, fleet plate. That's okay. That's for the rentals and for any kind of uh, corporation who lease the cars. Okay. B plate, which is the pickup truck and the vans, and the regular plate because, for example, let's say you have a Geico car, which is the you know Ford Fusion, but is wrapped right now under current uh, ordinance, cannot be parked because of the lettering, company lettering, on it. And just point of information: if someone was an Uber driver or a Lyft driver, technically by code, their car wouldn't be able to be parked on the street because it'd be a commercial vehicle. That's correct. We have actually a section, section for the uh, limo services and taxi services. They follow through a different section of the code. Yes. Uh, council member uh, So Kelly, in terms of trucks, it's just the, it's just B. B, yes. Okay. Council member Nusma. I had a resident who wanted to park a school bus on the street overnight. That would not be allowed. That would not be allowed because it's not the B plate. It's a totally different delivery plate or the passenger coach plate, something like this. It's a different size of, different different type of the plate mm -hmm. used for the bus. 
And the weight, I think, would also it's just disclose. Yeah. Uh, I just as a point of information, this ordinance is before us for introduction. Yes. Yeah. So maybe before, it, if we approve it tonight, before it comes back for approval, we can have a more definitive list of the vehicles that would be allowed. If there's any questions, concerns, just email me. I will try to answer them or yeah, iron it out for the future, for the next meeting. Well, it's gonna so it's gonna go to uh, council, and so it won't be back at this committee. Just right. to be clear, and. I found like a chart that I can share with folks that has uh, uh, it, that kind of shows images of what different weight classifications of vehicles are. So if I found that helpful. Okay. As a, Do you as have a that or we? Yeah, I can share it with folks. It, it was something I found online. Yeah, I would. Councilman Braithwaite. So my concern is I'm just looking at the footprint of the second ward. I'm already getting hammered with phone calls uh, during landscaping season that are parked in the alley and all this other stuff. So I. I would particularly with the second ward that has so many commercial businesses that are already there, in addition to that, so many narrow streets, I'm just, I'm predicting that I'm going to get more phone calls regarding trucks that, that, that park. And so I'm not, I have, I haven't received if I was to balance the complaints between residents who call and complain and people who call and say they need to place a truck, the residents outweigh those that are asking for this type of permit. So I'm not really sure, and I've said this before, what problem we're trying to solve, but I do know what problem will be created once residents, and I don't know what happens in other parts of town, so I can already speak for a second ward, like when residents start to see multiple vehicles on their street particularly in areas where you have a high school or or elementary schools all of a sudden this becomes very complicated and like i said this came as a referral from from the no, no i i get it so it gives us an opportunity to to, to talk about it so it's it's just it's a it's a matter of discussion that if, if we can't predict how many vehicles are going to okay. now be parked in residential areas, that's a pause for me. Um, there are places where there are schools and you already have permitted parking just because of those things. I'm just, that's my concern. I understand. If we may, can I go to Councilmember Burns, then we'll, I see Councilmember Ravel and then uh, Mike. I, I think probably Mr. Rivera is going to mention that the idea is that it would be for a resident who could obtain one permit for one vehicle and it would be, you know, to be able to park it in front of his home. I have a resident who has a, he's using a Prius from his workplace. It has a label for his company on the side and it's deemed a commercial vehicle and he can't park it overnight in front of his home. So I'm, I'm keenly interested in this as well. So maybe Mr. Rivera could talk about the, the limit on this. Uh, sure. Good evening, members of the committee. Mike Rivera, Interim Acting Services Director. Um, currently, I just wanted to point out that all commercial vehicles are prohibited from parking overnight between 9 p.m. and 7 a.m. on Evanston Streets. The reason why we're contemplating looking and proposing this uh, permit is because we've had inquiry from people in the sales industry. We've had people that are service techs that reside in Evanston that are property owners in Evanston. And then we have a fair amount of small business owners as well in, the, in Evanston that we they had inquiry as to how they could park their vehicles legally within the city limits. And by our code currently, we wouldn't be able to make any offerings to them. So with this lim very uh, minimal limitation to a passenger plate, a B license plate, and the F plate, which is the facilities, uh, which is the fleet plate, which is offered uh, through a lot of rental companies and a lot of uh, larger service companies offer the FP plate on the vehicles as well through the state of Illinois, um, we contemplated this would be the best measure to create a vehicle uh, commercial permit and residents would have to come into our office and uh, present documents 
that their company has allowed them to drive the vehicle into the Evanston limits, and then only one vehicle per property address would be eligible to obtain a commercial uh, permit. Thank you. Uh, Council Member uh, Burns. Hold on real quick, I'm trying to load uh, this back up. Um, can you point me to where in the ordinance it says, in the proposed ordinance, amended ordinance, it says that um, uh, one permit per address? I couldn't find okay. it earlier. Okay. So that was okay. first question. Um, Mr. Tatar. And that's, yeah, and that's yeah, not, yeah. we can figure that out, but I just wanted, that was just a, a quick note. I know this is just introduction. And then, um, you know, I think similar to Alderman Braith way, I understand the need for both sides. Um, you know, we both represent kind of working class areas where uh, folks are more likely to have both residential vehicles, but also um, uh, vehicles that use for business use. And so I'm sensitive to both. It's like, you have one set of residents who would like to park this second or third vehicle on the street without being ticketed, but then you have other people, both who are renting um, or who may not have um, use of their garage space, garages if they're, uh, if they're renting out a, a, a single family home that's been converted, who also need uh, you know, access to, to on-street parking. And um, I think my concern, which I expressed the last time is, uh, it would be if this was the only option uh, for the individual, and I know it's, it's difficult to to understand that. But if if there is another place that the um, that the resident can can park their vehicle, then I would want them to exercise that that option and not automatically, um, uh, as a default, you know, choose to park this vehicle on the street. And um, and so that's my concern is that I, I don't know if there's any way to keep 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 uh, um, a hold of that. And then also people to Alderman Braithwaite's point also, if we were able to freeze everybody that is parking on the street right now and say okay only you can get the permit, then it wouldn't be an issue. But now if we make it available, more people are going to use it. And so there's no way to understand unless we try it out. Um, how many people are going to say oh, okay I've been, you know paying a lot more for a garage or whatever it is to park it somewhere else and it's not as convenient because it's in Skokie or some other place. But now that this permit is available, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to exercise this opportunity to, to park it in front of my home. I just don't know what that looks like. So I, I definitely have my concerns around it. Unfortunately, I, I don't think there's any way to control it nor to predict how many people are going to take advantage of it. So this is a tough one, but um, I certainly understand uh, the need, and I'd like to just make. Sh I want to make sure that that uh, you know one per address is is in the ordinance. Okay. Thank you, Com That's all. Thank you, Councilmember Burns. Uh, since uh, everyone has spoken once, I'm going to take a quick opportunity here um, to to say that you know I am in support of this. Uh, I have a lot of folks in my ward who are uh, working class small business owners and who are landscapers uh, or just even Uber and Lyft drivers um, who have these commercial vehicles and uh, it, 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 it allows them to operate their business, be Evanston residents, it increases affordability uh, to, uh, to be able to have this option and I'll, I'll also say to Councilmember Burns, uh, to one of your inquiries there, that this permit costs money. It's not a free permit. Um, and if someone has a garage where they can park their vehicle and, and they can do that for free, I think they'll make that assessment if it makes sense to just park their vehicle for free in their own garage rather than paying uh, to park on the street. Right, it just be a cost benefit. No, I'm in an offsite for, garage for not, them. Yeah, sure, not but one you, you want, I know, and you mentioned uh, that uh, you want to make sure that folks we exhaust options first, and make sure that if someone has somewhere they can park their vehicle, right, their home. But more importantly, offsite though. Sure. Like at, at the workplace. Great, and my my point is that people make their own cost benefit analysis on that one, and so. Um, 
So I, I am in support of it for uh, those reasons, I think. Uh, and can you remind me, what is the permit cost? $30. $30. Thank you, $30 uh, annually, correct? Yes, and also the permit... It's also hard for us to enforce. That's why we have to put some kind of ordinance to know what we can enforce. Mm -hmm. And the uh, only way to enforce is to li link the license plate to the license, uh, license recognition system. That's why we have to pay for the permit and we have to register the car with the city. So when our uh, vehicles, our uh, parking system vehicles are running the plates, you can see if the permit is issued or not. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Berthwaite. Thank you. And I'm, I'm paying attention to the time. I'm. I'm sort of getting closer to this, and I understand. I appreciate uh, Councilmember Newsma. Is there anything with Luke and Mike just to treat it as a pilot program? Like I, I can already predict the disasters just based on what I deal with. But if, and I know that you want to be careful to make broad strokes in terms of you know different sides of town. But if Alderman uh, Rebel and suffered, I mean, if this is something that their residents are asking for then why not just pilot it in one of those areas or two and see what the impact will be over the course of the year and then we can measure it. I mean there's a potential that this adds a huge burden particularly around like snow removal and all those other things. I mean so before we get into all of that why don't we just pilot the damn thing and see if it works and if it works then. Sure. Uh, Council Member uh, uh, Braithwaite, my recommendation would be uh, Looking at it through an equity lens to offer it to all residents in the, in the city of Evanston would be to, if you can make a motion to, that we offer it as a pilot program for one year, and then we can obtain data of all the wards and who's applied for the permit, and then we can bring that back at a later date. I think if you do the whole thing for one year, you've opened up Pandora's box. And so, um, again, not wanting to take too much more time in this, uh, just try issuing it in the places where the council members are asking for it. And then if that goes well, I think the summer is a wonderful opportunity to gauge that. And then what will mostly happen for those that are just like, hold on, wait a second, then we can make that determination based on our feedback as well as feedback from our residents. It's so, Go ahead. So with that being said, um, would you be amenable to offering it to the first 100 vehicles anywhere in the city that come in and apply for the permit? I, I would not. Uh, if, if, if I can interject, we, we have folks all across the city. We know that we have, for example, Uber and Lyft drivers who fall under this category of commercial vehicle and we have a law in the books that says anyone who is a Uber or Lyft driver can is legally not allowed to park their own vehicle in front of their house because they use it for to either to deliver Uber or Lyft or so I, pick people. my question to that is I know people who drive Uber and there's one on my block all you have to do once you remove whatever that little tag is that they put in front of the car it's it's gone and I don't know that's fraud I mean, the by law, be, they're supposed to, if it's a commercial vehicle, they're I, supposed to register. I, I, I mean, understand. and there's no pickup I, Ubers. Let's reel this discussion in. Like, we could just address that vehicle, which is a much smaller vehicle. It's a passenger vehicle So anyway. this, uh, this right. we could reel it in a bit. But um, I, I, I just wanted to throw that in there. My light is on, so I'll speak yeah, when yeah. it's my time. But we're, we're not just Benusma. talking about small sedans and coupes. Councilman right. Benusma. I hear what Councilmember Council Braithwaite is saying, and you know, he's been the recipient of more phone calls than I have in his uh, career on the, on the council here. Um, based on my Googling here, if we're concerned about the size of a truck, just as a point of reference, a UPS truck that we all uh, are very familiar with, uh, that's about uh, 16,000 pounds minimum, so twice the size of what we would be limited to here. So I think this is worth a try as is. Um, nothing is permanent. If uh, this really goes sideways, we can stop it. Um, I like the idea if we are really concerned to authorize it for a, I'd be fine saying let's just do it, but uh, be willing to uh, give it a one year runway to see what happens and uh, you know, reconfirm in a year. If I may interject, I, I, I think a one-year pilot isn't really a pilot. I don't think that's giving any government policy long enough to, to, to work its way through the community. I will say, as you noted, that 
we are the city council, and at any moment we have the possible the 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 power to change any ordinance of the city. And so, whether we give it one year, we give it two years, ten years, whatever it is, at any point, any of us can make a referral. Uh, council Member Burns and Council Member Kelly. Um, I would ask that this be a, a one year um, uh, pilot across the city. I think it is important to be in every ward because I want to see what happens in the fifth ward because that's what I'm concerned about. I'm not as concerned about the sixth and seventh wards and I'm, I'm concerned about five. I'm concerned about, you know, I know Alderman Braithwaite you're concerned about too. So I think we we have to include those wards in order to know what happens. But, you know, I would be fine with a year or two pilot. I think a year is enough if we, um, you know, get the information out there appropriately. I know there, again, are people that have called me and said, look, I just got a ticket. I've been parking my truck here for years, just got a, a ticket for the first time. I had to explain to them that it's not allowed. I think that this particular gentleman had a pickup truck that, um, they had might have had B plates, but it wasn't wrapped. And so again, I understand exactly what the concern is and, and where the need lies. Um, but I think a pilot is in, is important because then it automatically comes back instead of having to work its way through the referral process, which we now have in committee process and, and then the council. So it, it allows us to, as we did with the meters along the lakefront, to have a, a, a defined date where it's going to come back and we can discuss it. Well, with ordinances. It's not quite the way it works. Uh, Council Member Kelly? Um, no. Yeah, and I, I just want to go back to the issue of equity. It's not about the equitable distribution of, um, of these permits as much as it is about undermining neighborhoods. And I am concerned about the trucks more than anything. I, ha I have friends in the trades, and they have these Class B trucks, and they're big, a 7,900-pound truck. I would not want that in front of my house. And and you know, I respect Alderman Braithwaite's concerns here that some neighborhoods are going to have more of these trucks parked on their street. And so, um, and and the folks I know that work in the trades think this is kind of crazy. They're like, "Yeah, you have a truck, you have to just figure it out." That's part of the deal um, is figuring out. You know, you paid put your truck somewhere. And I would also like to suggest that maybe as a city, do we not have like is there a lot that we could designate um, a couple throughout, or maybe that's something we look at. Um, lots for this that we charge because I don't think a Class B truck should be parked on the street. And I think, you know, people in the trades also don't expect to be able to park their, a big truck like that on the street. Now, the Uber situation, I don't like that to me isn't as, as problematic visually where that's not um, impairing neighborhood integrity the way a big truck does. So can this be amended? Would um, Alderman Sufferdin and Ravel consider an amendment to this uh, where Point of information, mm -hmm. what is neighborhood integrity? What does that mean? Meaning, like, I think everybody enjoys view. Like, when, if you look out your window, if you're on the ground floor, that you don't hit, it's not right up against a truck. I think a lakefront people enjoy expansive views and, and not having your, your street lined by trucks, for example. Uh, just point of information, does mm -hmm. anyone know how much a Hummer weighs? In fact, the 2022 the GMC to Hummer <laughs> EV, does anybody know how much that weighs? The, the new electric Hummer weighs 9,063 pounds. Uh, if I own that car and I put my, stick my passenger plates on it because it's my personal car, I could park a hundred of them out in front of my house. If I, you know, if I own some huge pickup truck and I used it because that's just my culture, right? I'm from Kentucky or something and I like to drive pickup trucks. I can park my huge pickup truck with all kinds of accoutrement on it, as long as it's my personal vehicle out in front of my house, and there's no mm -hmm. problem with that. So I don't know that, what the integrity For you, that's that not is. a problem. For that you, is? It's not. not commercial attachments right oh, now, right? Well, okay, yeah. well, okay. Right. I mean, it, not commercial attachments, but it could be. I could just have a big rack or something on it, and it's just put bikes on it. That would be legal. If, if it had a, if it had a, a commercial ladder rack or attachments to the roof of the vehicle, it would be dubbed a commercial vehicle because those are commercial attachments. And the pickup like this will still require the B plate. Uh, in the state of Illinois, the B pickup trucks require the B plate, any kind of size of the pickup pickup truck. So even if you this is your personal vehicle, still require the B plate. Okay. But my Hummer wouldn't. That weighs ten thousand pounds. Yeah, because it's on the pickup. Okay. Truck. 
I think where we're hung up here is not knowing quite sure how big and ugly uh, we would be allowing if we uh, approve this as written. I'm moving right? for a pilot in their specific wards, and we'll see. For those of us, once it starts, we'll get phone calls to yeah. decide if it's something we want to move. And because trying to claw this thing back, like if, if, after if, you pass, it's going to be. If it's good in six and seven, it's good, good, in, an ordinance. It's good in the fourth ward too. I mean, again, I'm I'm specifically talking based on the assets. So I I have like Ward Five. There are people. This is an issue that we've had to deal with, where vehicles, particularly landscape vehicles, are parked in the back door. So these are complaints that I'm getting already, and and based on the proximity to school as well as some very very narrow streets. I also get complaints when uh, during snow removal and vehicles can't be moved. So. I can speak for what I know, and if I get a bunch of phone calls from residents who want to opt in, then I will weigh that option. But for now, I'm saying that I don't want to invite that issue. If somebody else wants to take that on and see, I think that's great that you can do that on behalf of your residents, and I mean, that's where I'm at with it. It's not any else for me to debate. Member Kelly. So, so just to clarify, I oh, mean, my, my resident has a, it's a passenger vehicle and it mere, it simply has an emblem from his company on the side. And so that's, I, I think that's fine. But if you yeah. see what the code says and how big they can go, that's where right. it's going to create an issue. Okay. Residents as well, well as well, my trying last, to enforce. I, I, I my have last comment I was going to make is, can we, in addition to potentially piloting or maybe amending to remove the big trucks, um, one or the other. Could we also look at the possibility of maybe the city, you know, if there's any places for lots or something like that where we could offer maybe, you know, for pay, of course. Currently, the city offers uh, parking for B license plate vehicles within any of the three uh, parking garages in the city of Evanston and in any of the parking lots that we have availability. Um, but we don't have specific lots that are dubbed for commercial vehicles or, or, to, uh, or to accommodate certain size vehicles. As well as any street that doesn't have over 50% residential units, right? They can park there. That's correct. Did did we? I do remember requesting a map that would uh, display uh, uh, all of the blocks that have less than 50% residential that, units. That's that's a request that I've made to our uh, IT department and GIS, and we're kind of waiting for them to work through that for us. Okay. Um, I, just a time. I don't think it would I'm be I'm sorry, fair. Council Member Kelly had her light on, and then we can I go to you. I think that was from before. Yeah. Again, I just would like, I mean, I realize what we what exists um, right now, but I'm just wondering if there's any chance of just um, considering the, the possibility of new lots just for that, maybe a couple in town, one on the southwest sides. Okay, thank you. Council Member Brown? Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, certainly agreeable to looking at lots and other alternatives. I just think if we do it, it would not be fair to only have it in a select few neighborhoods, um, especially neighborhoods, you know, on the North Shore. I think that would not look good. And we, I'd get calls, um, I, I'd get calls from residents saying, why can't I participate in that program? So again, I'm personally fine if we're going to look at an entirely different alternative such as council member uh, Kelly your idea but I don't I don't think it would be fair to only pilot this in a few neighborhoods well, I think I have to agree with I, I think if I may if I may mention also the parking lots that we that are permitted lots today are primarily fully occupied and um, we wouldn't have the ability to you know um, void the permits that are kind of currently issued to make that lot into a a commercial lot, if you will, because there, there are folks who are currently active, and we have, and a lot of lots even have wait lists. Thank and you, Councilmember Kelly. Rook, to your, because you just, it's not just the Class B, but it's the weight as well. And I looked at the weight, and I didn't see this vehicle as one uh, something that was eight thousand or below. Um, I think it is really just cargo, you know, like the utility and cargo vans, the smaller vans, commercial vans, and uh, and the pickup trucks. So I'm not. As concerned with the truck as much, but uh, I, you know, I would personally like to, to to pilot this. If we're going to do it, let's pilot it, do it citywide for a year, and then go from there. But I, I don't think what you just sent, Councilmember Kelly, would is is probably. I don't think that's eight thousand. That that looks heavier than that. And having a list probably would help. And when this comes back, I don't know if this is going to council. 
um, t tonight or or what the next step is for. It, but that's how I, that's how it would. Is. Yes, if if we passed it here, it would move on to council for introduction. Okay, so we have some time. I think everybody has expressed their position on this, so we can move on. Councilmember Nusa, can you share that document that you shared with me in terms of the vehicle oh, sizes sure. with everyone else, just so we sure. are all on the same page? Thank you. Okay. Um, so, are we making any amendments to this, or are folks comfortable moving this on to council? Again, it's if. If it doesn't say one per address, I just want to make sure that would be in the ordinance. That would be an amendment. I think it does say one per address, correct? Did you find it? I believe so. Yes. I don't have the if, whole. I don't have the. I don't have the whole complete ordinance with me. I just have the the first page. Well, I didn't. I didn't see it in the ordinance, but um, that would be it. And Thompson, then, Berkeley, uh, Bur I mean, uh, Brithwaite, or you all. If we're on piloting, council? then I would also add that, and I don't have his. Uh, Councilmember Newsma has the different sizes of vehicle that we only allow passenger vehicles small passenger so you're vehicles. are you looking to amend this to only i would i would make that i would make that, make that motion. there's enough uh, so i would move that we eliminate the b plate eliminate the b plate and just identify it as passenger vehicles which and to the, your point the fleet. Would be uber drivers and small vehicles with a wrap so, as well as the fp plate correct which would be um, the fleet that would be like a for example i think a council member Ravel's person would be an fp plate likely so as long as it looks like a passenger vehicle and it doesn't take up typically a large they footprint. Are. typically fp plates may be pickup trucks and light vans that's fine okay um all right uh well is there a second to that i second uh moved by council member Newsome, seconded by council member Kel Moved by Braithwaite. I'm sorry. Yeah, comes from Braithwaite. Uh, both of you have kind of uh, yeah, nice, nice yeah. flowing names. Uh, <laughs> Braithwaite seconded by Councilmember Kelly. Um, uh, is there any discussion on the amendment? Uh, I, I will just say I uh, do not. Uh, I, I, I both support the amendment and don't. I would love to see something that allows for my residents who are working class pickup truck owners who are working in the hot sun uh, on landscaping uh, for those folks to be able to uh, park their vehicles in front of their homes and not receive regular tickets. Uh, but I will support, uh, I support moving something forward uh, to bring into compliance a whole host of people uh, who are currently operating outside of the law with their Uber vehicles. Uh, those, in, is there any further discussion on that? I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to make sure so staff understands the amendment. It, the amendment is to eliminate the B and the FP plate? Just so the B. Just the B. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor of that amendment, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Aye. Oh, okay. Any abstentions? I'm, I'm going to have to call a roll because uh, I have a roll call on that. Sure. Uh, you didn't vote, Bobby. Councilmember Braithwaite. Aye. Councilmember Newsma. Nay. Councilmember Burns. Uh, aye for now. Aye. Councilmember Reed. Nay. Councilmember Kelly. Aye. Okay. The ayes have it. Uh, that is for the amendment uh, to eliminate the B plate uh, from this. Um, <laughs> All right. Uh, and now I just want to make it clear that what we're voting on now is that folks who have a small kind of regular vehicle parked out in front of their house that happens to be commercial now have to pay $30 more uh, because their vehicle is wrapped or because they're an Uber or Lyft driver. Uh, so... Uh, with that amendment, uh, the main motion has been properly moved and seconded. Seeing no further discussion on the main motion, uh, may I have a roll call vote?
Councilmember Braithwaite. Aye. Councilmember Newsma. Aye. Councilmember Burns. Aye. Councilmember Reed. No. Councilmember Kelly. Aye. Okay. Uh, that is passed. I voted no because we're just now we're just charging Uber drivers thirty dollars more. I, it made sense with the the pickup trucks. Okay. This now it doesn't make sense to me. Okay. okay. Uh, Thank you. And now we're moving on to items for discussion, progressive will tax uh, discussion. Mr. Chair, I'll move item D1 uh, for discussion. Uh, is there a second? It's been moved by Councilmember Brunusma. Is there a second? Seconded by Ken, Councilmember Kelly. Thank you. Uh, I'll just quickly uh, introduce this. I made a referral a while ago for a for conservation pricing for the wheel tax. Uh, the goal was to encourage environmental uh, uh, sustainability as well as provide additional funding for the city to meet our CARB goals. Uh, direct. Uh, forgetting your position again. Uh, administrative uh, services. Uh, director um, Mike Rivera has uh, put together a number, and, and Lucas uh, have put together a number of uh, proposals. Uh, I personally support proposal two. I don't want to belabor the discussion uh, too much, and that would add a dollar to the wheel tax uh, across the board, and that dollar uh, addition to the wheel tax across the board would then go into the uh, uh, CARP plan. And so this would be the first. Uh, or the CARP funding. Uh, so this would be the first source of revenue, solid source of revenue for uh, our CARP uh, uh, budget, uh, and so I support that option. Is there feedback from other members on the committee? Council Member Option two. Uh, option two looks like the best one to me. Uh, I'm not even uh, sure we would have to limit that to a one dollar increase. Sure. Um, I'll throw out five dollars. Sure. Uh, but open to. Uh, charging a little bit more for a passenger vehicle and using that money into uh, the fund that we just created the last budget cycle, the, I think we're calling it the Climate Action Fund or the CARP Fund. So we do have a place to put that money. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Uh, see, uh, seeing uh, no uh, further discussion, I think the direction is to move forward with a proposal that mirrors uh, item uh, or option two, uh, and I would be supportive of up to a you know uh, a five or ten dollar. I mean, heck, I'd, here's one thing I want to note. Uh, let me uh, bring this into the discussion quickly. Um, for example, our current wheel tax is 80, am I saying, is it 84 or 85 dollars? 85 dollars. 85 dollars currently. Um, Chicago, for example, for a passenger vehicle, um, and there's, it's, it's 90, uh, it's 90 dollars, it's 95 dollars and 42 cents, uh, for 2022 for a large passenger vehicle, right? And so they also, they don't just say one vehicle pays the same price across the board. It depends on the size. Of the vehicle, we, we also have a tiered system as well. You know, as they go up in size, they, oh, okay. uh, so does the the price. Okay. Well, I, I will say for uh, so the re our regular passenger vehicle then is eighty five. That is correct. And then a large passenger vehicle is, I believe it's one fifty. One fifty. Okay. And so their their and their price, especially for the passenger vehicle, is is substan is significantly higher than ours. It's about ten dollars higher. Um, so I'm, I'm fine raising uh, the price five to ten dollars to come close to uh, parity with Chicago. Uh, Councilman Brunusma. I also noticed in the memo uh, that we have ten thousand vehicles a year that are not paying their wheel tax, which is quite a bit of money. Uh, if, if it was eighty-five dollars each, that's eight hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. That is correct. What can we do to increase the compliance? Uh, what we can do to increase compliance is, is mandate that prior to selling them the current year's wheel tax, uh, have the resident uh, provide the vehicle registration for the year previous. And if the vehicle was registered in Evanston and they didn't purchase a wheel tax, then we make them buy the 2021 wheel tax while they're coming in to purchase the 2022 wheel tax. 
I'm concerned that might lower compliance, that if you didn't comply one year, you certainly wouldn't come back the next year if you're going to be double. Well, I mean, we don't have any other ability to, to make them comply, but other than mailing letters, which we do that currently. I wonder is, uh, sorry to jump in on your question, but I, I do wonder, uh, is a visible sticker on the car? I mean, I know there was, I, I forget the exact reason that we moved away. I mean, it seems like smart policy to not just do a sticker and just tax folks, but is a visible reminder on your windshield that says, look, you are out of compliance and everyone in the world will be able to see that your vehicle is not in compliance. Does that, does Chicago, for example, if, if there are 10,000 vehicles outside of compliance, I would imagine there's 50,000 vehicles in the city. How many vehicles do we have in the city? Do we know? In Evanston, we have 50,000 vehicles that are registered and approximately 40,000 are complying year over year. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so that's a fairly, that's one fifth of our folks not complying is Chicago or other cities that have an actual sticker. Is their non-compliance rate that high? I, I haven't investigated that. And, and a lot of the reason that, that we get some non-compliance is because lots in Evanston are fairly large and people have driveways and people have large garages and people have sometimes multiple vehicles or even collector car vehicles. And while they should be um, registering those vehicles and paying the wheel tax in the city for the city of Evanston, if, if they're not using those vehicles routinely, like a collector vehicle, and they take it out once a week or once a month, they'll try to skirt um, not paying for that wheel tax. Do we issue tickets for vehicles that the scanning technology does identify? Yes, yes, we do that. So so we, our license plate recognition system will, will do a, a cross check from the state of Illinois and it pulls from the state of Illinois database as well as the city of Evanston wheel tax database. So, so we, when we're out there, we precisely know if the vehicle is registered in Evanston and hasn't paid for a wheel tax or if it's in, in full compliance. And so tickets would be issued only for parked vehicles. Nobody's pulled over if they're... No, we, we do not. The parking enforcement team will not pull anybody over for that. Right. Right. And you can't go into anybody's garage or their backyard. To, no, no, sir, we wouldn't. The ticket folks. But we know who they are. If we know there's 10,000 or so vehicles that should have paid the tax but haven't. Correct. Can't we take any other action to uh, enforce the collection? Um, we can see about issuing a second letter. I mean, I know, I know we issue, we do issue a, a letter annually for renewal for wheel tax. And then if somebody doesn't uh, come in and comply and purchase a wheel tax, we'll issue a letter so we can see about incrementally adding more letters. But in doing so, um, we need to be mindful that letters also cost money. So, I mean, each mailing costs us a dollar and fifty uh, cents per mailing. So as we take those up, it's also an investment that we're making and not potentially reaping the benefit of it. Yeah, but if we're leaving $850,000 untapped, you know, it seems like we sure. but, should but be like, able to but, get some of that back. But like I said, we don't have a we don't have any administrative rules. We don't have a, anything on a city council ordinance that says prior to being sold to current years will tax you must be in compliance for subsequent years prior. Mm -hmm. We don't have any language like that today. Do we? Sorry. Do we boot vehicles so you don't pay their wheel tax? We shut off water if someone doesn't pay their water bill. We, we'll we'll boot vehicles if they amass three or more tickets. And that, that could be wheel tax, but not specifically boot a vehicle for not purchasing a wheel tax. We don't do that. I, I don't think that we should, but I just compared to water. I mean, if we're booting, if we're, yeah. Uh, Council Member Kelly. So, yeah, I'm concerned about the tenor here. I've gotten complaints from um, a good number of residents about the high cost and getting ticketed downtown. We've, we've discussed it, so thank you. So the city does collect hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines from citations, um, and that should be noted. Um, I, I hate to hear that we want to move in an even more unfriendly way in Evanston. Right now, I have complaints from residents who park downtown because it's not, you know, a visible. I, mean, I know a lot of people miss this. And then they got a really, what is the ticket, an $80 ticket? It's a $60 ticket. $60 ticket plus then they have to pay the $20 late fee. It's a $25 late fee, which would make the wheel tax 110 right. for being so late it's, plus the citation. Right. So it's really expensive. And, and so all this talk about booting and everything else, we need to move the city in the other direction. So I've actually been um, talking with um, Director Rivera about other ways we could do this so it's not so menacing and off-putting and making people not want to have d dinner downtown because right now I have received several complaints, more than several, um, from residents who got the pricey fine and then, you know, in addition to the late fee and everything else. So I'm not looking to put on boots or jack this up anymore. I think we already have, I think we need to move in the other direction 
and um, move this to become a friendlier city. And not, I think everything that we do should be to the point, it should have a reason. It shouldn't be just to fund a, you know, an enterprise department. It should be because for, you know, so I just think we have to be careful about this. And I know you did propose a, an idea to make this. We are currently um, having conversations with Allison Lipsiger, our policy coordinator, and um, the city manager's uh, team, and um, uh, uh, surrounding fees and fines. So, so right. to, it is a conversation that we've initiated, and we're 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 trying to identify different ways to uh, address the the fine amounts mm -hmm. and incentivize people to be compliant by purchasing wheel tax. Right, and I think you mentioned idea to incentivize, so it wouldn't be so so folks would be more inclined to get it rather than it, it wasn't about making it so costly. Punitive. It wasn't using a punitive approach. In fact, it would be. I, I can't remember now, but you did. Pr you mentioned something. Yeah, to there, that there, I was, there was multiple. There was multiple ways we can do that. Uh, you know, I, I think you had brought up one way was um, uh, if we issued a citation and somebody came in and, and and bought the wheel tax within a limited amount of time after receiving the citation, would we waive the the citation? And, and that is that it's something that could be considered, right? Mm -hmm. um, we just have to see what that looks like. I think that's a great idea. Okay, um, I think we still have clear direction and moving forward to come back with a proposal there to increase the wheel tax by around $5. Um, and we can maybe even work in what Councilmember Kelly said there that we'd waive the ticket price if, uh, if folks pay within a whatever time frame. I would give folks at least two weeks, but you know, whatever staff comes up with. All right. Uh, seeing uh, no further discussion on that item, uh, we can move on to item our last item for the night, which is item D2, soccer pitches on city-owned property at 1805 Church Street and 1708 through 10 Darrow Avenue. Councilmember Burns, would you like to move that? Uh, yes, I move D2 soccer pitches on city owned property at 1805 Church Street and 17. Yep. Moved by Councilmember Burns. Avenue. Seconded Second. by Councilmember Kelly. Okay. I just read the whole um, If Neil, or I'm sorry, if, uh, if Jeremy is on the line, if he could quickly walk us through uh, the PDF that he uh, provided, I think it's in the packet, but if you, are you still on the line? Yeah, I'm on the line. There you go. All right. You got the floor. All right. So um, we propose to put two street soccer pitches down at this property on Darrow. The pitches um, we would we would remove and grade using an environmentally friendly material. Um, the pitches would be free for anyone in the city to use. We could have a system where uh, if you didn't come with your own soccer ball, you could check out a soccer ball across the street. We have had these pitches down in Evanston since 2016 in various locations. Um, mostly, uh, well, all of them have been temporary, but the temporary can be as, as long as two to three years. We had one pitch outside of uh, Robert Crown Center where it was there for over two years. We had turf down. And uh, as I mentioned at the top of the meeting, it was one of the most used amenities in the city uh, outside of the beach. The thing that we've learned with these and that uh, Evanston has proven out as a testing ground for us is that these pitches really do a great job of building communities. They uh, provide a safe haven for kids to go. Um, the people, the residents treat them as a sacred space we have not seen to date any um, graffiti or marks or uh, vandalism of the street soccer pitches. Um, boys, girls, different ages, ethnicities, uh, it really is a melting pot. I think partially because of uh, the shared love of soccer, the beautiful game, and partially because uh, the way it's played with walls and goals built in there uh, the, the game doesn't stop as much. If, if we're playing a large, on a large field and um, you can just run away from someone who's smaller than you, you, you're not running away from anyone here. You're not kicking the ball harder than anyone else here. And um, the ball changes possession so many times that you're, you're just able to, um, no one gets upset if you lose possession. And so uh, what we saw at the Robert Crown <clears throat> Uh, pitch was 
kids self-organizing, playing on their own, making up their own rules. Um, they, they play two on two all the way up to 10 on 10 inside one of these tiny little pitches. Um, and our proposal is to put two of these pitches in the space and let kids self-organize there. Um, if you uh, if you want our help in programming, uh, we, we, that's certainly available for something else that we, we also do. We did a very successful um, tournament in Chicago last year. We have two permanent pitches down in Chicago. We've got pitches in Boston, San Francisco, Orlando, uh, Minnesota, and uh, other places around the country as well. But um, uh, I'd be happy to share some quotes. Um, I don't have those in front of me, but one of the pitches we had down for three years uh, next to Shields Elementary School in Chicago, those kids, that's a, that's a really rough neighborhood. Those kids were going over there. They called it an oasis. Um, it was somewhere they could go after school where it was safe and many times safer than their own house. Uh, thank you. So th this was an idea that so, uh, a few months ago we um, uh, toured a few different potential locations around the city for these uh, uh, soccer pitches, and, and Council Member Kelly nudged me and said, "Hey, I think you know Church and Darrow might be a good location. It's the proposed site of a uh, of a future residential development, um, but it's been it sat vacant now for quite some time." And it's been a goal of mine to, you know, revitalize and activate underutilized um, spaces or spaces that aren't utilized at all. And so this is a way to um, to improve the site, to 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 repave it or improve it in some ways, at least the grading at a minimum, and to add these soccer pitches, uh, which was just described as as a way. Um, you know, we AY, through AYSO and Team Evanston, we, we have some pretty good uh, soccer programming. Um, but as somebody that plays soccer growing up, you still benefit from having um, a location closer to where you live, where you can you know, get other, get some additional touches and um, and and improve your, your your touch and your play. And I think having this uh, right at Church and Darrow. Uh, will go nicely with the skate park that we've we're also looking at, and there's a canoe launch also proposed close to the fifth ward. Uh, of course, we have basketball courts and uh, and baseball diamonds, and so um, you know, unfortunately, I've heard some people with sports say, oh, "Well, that's not something black uh, people play." Well, that's that's not true. Black folks excel at at any sport when it's accessible, when it's properly programmed, and I think this will benefit all um, all age groups and ethnicities here in the city, and um, I think it's a, a excellent temporary option for a site that is, um, is, isn't is utilized at all right now. So uh, I would, uh, hopefully, if anybody has any questions, we could we could use Jeremy's time to, to answer those, to ask those questions. Thank you. Uh, to center the discussion, I'll just ask, uh, what exactly is the direction for staff that we're looking for in this discussion item? Uh, staff can probably lead on that question. I presume. I don't know what the next steps will be. This is something that is a TIF eligible use because of it's um, be considered kind of infrastructure and kind of a, a, a public feature in the area. But Paul, you can talk about what the next steps would be. Thanks. All right. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Paul Zalmazak, Economic Development Manager. Uh, we. Um, uh, on behalf of Council Member Burns, brought this forward as a discussion item. Um, that what we mentioned in the uh, staff report is that you would need to find budget. Like, what are you going to essentially cut from the budget to make this happen, or how, or what are you going to reallocate to make this happen? It's TIF funds, Paul. We don't have to cut anything. It's West Evanston no, TIF. Right. I mean, TIF, TIF funds can be used for some of the cost, and we we know that the cost is somewhere in the range of 150 to 470 depending on the nature of the pitches um, so yes we can use TIF for site prep but acquisition of the pitches and things like that are not going to be a TIF eligible cost so we have to figure out we have to figure out what the budget is and I would need Mr. Venata and, and, and um, Mr. Levine to help us figure that out so if this is something that we can relocate to different areas 
within the TIF boundary year over year, what's the difference between that and lights that has been a TIF eligible expense? Yeah, are you talking about street lights on? Right, yeah, like the, the decorative, you know, seasonal. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, considered, that's considered that that's considered city infrastructure, whereas this is. Would not be? It's a fine line, right? I mean, we're talking about a recreational. It's, it would be pushing TIF to, to a boundary that I'm not sure we're going to win in, in in a court battle, so to speak. I don't think. No, I don't. And, I, you know, right. we don't have to go there. Um but it just, if, I mean, if lights were considered, you just would think that something like this could be if it was because it's temporary, because it could be relocated by design, you know, it's in the way we're discussing it is meant to be relocated. Right. So, so perhaps something we can discuss. Yeah, perhaps one of the directions would be to have staff work with the law department to determine to what extent this particular project would be 100 percent fundable with with TIF funding. Um, yeah, that's a good next one, a good next step for sure. Because then that does change things. I was under the impression that this was could be in, entirely uh, funded by TIF. So that's certainly a question I have. Okay, Councilman Bernusma. I'm uh, wondering uh, where the Department of Parks and Recreation is when it comes to this uh, soccer pitch. It seems like that kind of project would be their purview. Uh, if they do, they have a, an official opinion on this, or have they been part of this discussion? Um, uh, former Director Hemingway was at the table, and obviously he's no longer here. And this would be something that the Parks Department would likely be very involved in. Again, um, in the interest of time, I was trying to shepherd this on behalf of the council member and staff just to continue to keep the conversation moving. If this were to go forward for a consideration, we would definitely need Parks and Rec at the table. Just to underscore that, he, he was actually on the tour with us, myself, Councilmember Kelly, um, you know, Jeremy, Neil, uh, and, um, and others. We went to different sites around the city. So the former direct Parks Director who recently left um, was, was very much so involved. And help me understand the time sensitivity here. And the question I'm getting at is, would there be anything wrong with can, taking this up in the 2023 budget? I mean, well, well, one, we make amendments all the time after we pass a budget. We did it with the canoe launch. We, we, we do it all the time. Um, but, uh, it, it, again, it depends on whether or not it's a, a TIF-eligible use. There, there's a lot of TIF expenses that aren't necessarily part of the budget because, you know, they if they're over a certain amount, they need to be approved by the council. Um, but things come up like, again, um, you know, TIF money can be used to support local businesses, for example. So if a business on Church and Dodge makes a request for some type of in, um, interior in, improvement um, th that is considered a kind of a leasehold expense, then, you know, they can make a request in between our budget cycle and, and get it funded. So it's a bit different when, you, when we're dealing with uh, with these uh, uh, TIF-funded programs. But again, I, I think we have, I think the question is how much of this can be, you know, funded through TIF, and if not, then we have to look for other funding. Is $150,000 the amount we're talking about here? I think that's still to be determined as yeah, well. Yeah, I, I think we'd have to ask Mr. Venetta. Okay. Because, uh, well, there, there are options. 150 so for just- $150,000 would be one pitch. But if you want two pitches, lights, turf, um, you know, we're not making any money off of this. We're, we're citizens of Evanston. We've been doing this uh, at our cost since 2016, putting down these uh, pitches. This is just the first time we've come to city council uh, requesting funds for something that you would own. Thank you. And this, uh, would, this would only be for two years in this location. Right, and that's one of the timing issues is that if we're gonna do it there, the season's coming to install it. Let's let's use it before um, HODC and, and Mount Pisgah move forward with their project. That that's again that's a 2024 development uh, calendar for that. Right. So 150,000 for or more for just two years is then no you, because again you can relocate. It. You can relocate again and and, and it's, it's relocate it for an additional whatever 50,000 or whatever yeah. in site yeah. prep. Separate. Yeah, and I mean it's it, it no matter what you if we do it, it costs money. Uh, the question is, and I think maybe, you know, Jeremy and Neil can talk to this is like how, 
well utilized these sites are because it's one thing to have a basketball court or baseball diamond, but if it's not utilized, it's just sitting there. Um, I think what we've heard is um, for community members of all ages actually utilize uh, these soccer pitches because it's a quicker pace. It's almost similar to if you had, I don't know, I'm reaching here a little bit, but like a much smaller basketball court with trampolines. Like it's a much more intense experience because it's a, uh, uh, much shorter court and it, it's, it's intense. You get a lot more touches and people are using it. And that's what matters. It's not just having these recreation opportunities, but, but investing in the things that people are, are actually interested in using. So I think if we, I, unfortunately, I wasn't there. I, I, I've never noticed these. I guess they've, they've been up all across the city. I wish I could have experienced it myself, but I'm going off of, uh, what we've heard from Jeremy and others, and maybe between now and the next time this comes back, people that have uh, utilized these soccer pitches across the city can uh, can speak during public comment about you know how uh, you know how was it a benefit to them? Thank you, uh, Councilmember Keller. So um, every day when I leave school, leave work, and drive by that corner, I just get really excited about the possibility, the prospect of seeing that that area activated in such a healthy healthy way. In fact, I'd love to see more sort of healthy activity squares around our town that are so accessible, right, that you don't have to be in a programmed expensive sport, but that you can just go a pick up accessible, um, um, you know, unprogrammed place to be healthy and active and physical, especially coming out of COVID. I just, I think this and, you know, other squares throughout town is something we should look at, you know, pickleball, other things that are just very accessible, basketball courts, um, soccer pitches, I think this is a wonderful possibility. And I, and again, I think we should look at expanding the options. And I think it does build community, and this is so important as well, as well as being, you know, something really healthy and activity for everybody of all ages, it really pulls community together. And so I, I hope this goes through. Thank you. Great. Uh, so it seems, I'm trying to read the pulse of the committee, uh, that we are interested in moving forward with this and having staff uh, work with legal to determine uh, what the, how much of this project is TIF eligible. And, you know, after that determination, or, and then first determine, and then also determine how much this project is gonna be overall, what we're looking to do exactly. Um, I, I guess, is there any feedback on that particular issue? Are we looking to do one pitch, two pitches? We're looking to have lighting. It seems like because this is, this is going to be a temporary location. We're probably going to go, want to go with a pretty simple, pretty simple design. Uh, so are we looking at two pitches without lighting? And I'm not sure at this point. I think once I think we just start with, you know, what is eligible uh, under TIF, and then we could talk about the rest offline. Okay. Yeah, the packet says two pitches. Okay. And also, I just want to clarify that I think what we're talking about is not, we wouldn't have grass. It would be a gravel surface or a compacted gravel surface. Yeah, I think what they recommended is to definitely have lighting. Um, and, and Jeremy, I don't know if you want to quickly kind of speak to what's in the packet and then what you would recommend in addition. Yeah. So uh, two pitches would be 325. Um, the grading of the surface and, and resurfacing that piece is, is 150. Um, a single or portable pitch just on the graded surface would be $80,000 plus the $145,000 for the grading and resurfacing. That, that, yeah, that's the one thing I have concern with, with this is $150,000 to grade a piece of property that's going to be used in a year or two doesn't sound like a great investment to me. Um, and the, we're, but I, I do think, our, excuse me, yeah, but I, I do think that uh, certainly, you know, I believe in the project, I, I think it's good if there is, I'd also be interested if there's an alternative location in the area where we could look at it uh, in an area where if we do make this kind of investment, there's the potential for it to exist longer than just a year or two. Uh, Councilmember Burns. Um, I think whether it's retail or recreation, I think actually there's an advantage of having kind of pop up more flexible um, opportunities uh, for the community, one. But two, that proposal is not even, I don't even think anything submitted on the on the 
residential proposal. Um, we're just in the earlier stages of, of a conversation. We hope to break ground around that time, but there's nothing's final. So I just want to be clear. That's just okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, all right. Is there any further discussion on that item? Seeing, uh, do you have the direction that you need, Paul? Thank you. Great. Uh, seeing no further discussion on this item and seeing no further business before the uh, Public Works Committee, the Administration and Public Works Committee, um, uh, this meeting is now adjourned and planning and development will start in. Uh,